day. Today, Thursday, 28th March, many things continue to happen around the world. In Beijing, uh, President Xi Jinping has just had a meeting with a powerful delegation of U.S. business leaders in the United States. Um, Robert Kennedy Jr. has picked his vice presidential candidate, the uh, former wife of one of the founders of Google, a person who it is expected will be able to provide significant financial support to his campaign. And it turns out that one of Donald Trump's um, financial supporters, a member of the Mellon family, has also donated $20 million to Robert Kennedy's campaign as well. And um, elsewhere, China and India have had what have been described as candid and open talks about their border conflict, their decades-long border conflict. Prime Minister, uh, Foreign Minister, Indian Foreign Minister Jai Shankar says that India is not prepared to make any compromises, but no doubt it is an important fact that these talks are taking place. And previously, there's been a history of China having talks about its borders with other countries, with first with the Soviet Union and eventually with Russia, and the talks can be protracted and very difficult, but eventually compromises are reached and decisions are made, and the border issue is resolved. And personally, I expect that at some point, eventually, the same will happen with the dispute, which the border dispute between India and China. And of course, the situation in the Middle East remains extremely tense. The bombing campaign of the Houthis continues to no evident point that I can see. We're waiting to see what the next diplomatic moves will be following the UN Security Council resolution of a few days ago, demanding an immediate ceasefire. The complex game of diplomatic chess that's playing out there will no doubt before long resume. But of course, it's the conflict in Ukraine, which I make no apology for focusing on, because in spite of everything, it remains the single most important conflict, the most dangerous one, confrontation between the United States and a nuclear superpower. Russia remains a very real possibility, and no less a person than Vladimir Putin addressed that very topic in a somewhat indirect, indirect way over the course of a visit he made to a training centre, a military training centre for helicopter pilots near the town of Toshuk in Russia. Now, this is an interesting visit. Uh, the Russian Defence Ministry and the Kremlin have provided us with very carefully edited photographs of this visit. They have striven to avoid providing pictures that would identify any of the trainee pilots whom Putin met. And in addition, when there was a question and answer session between Putin and some of these trainee pilots, some of the questions were clearly edited to make them appear much shorter than they obviously were. And the names of the trainee pilots who asked the questions were not identified. So a decision has clearly been made to keep the identities of these trainee pilots secret so as to protect them from any kind of retaliation from the Ukrainians or from the powers, the various powers that support Ukraine in this confrontation. But anyway, Putin did make some very important comments over the course of this visit. The one that has attracted the most attention and which has been most widely commented upon is a lengthy statement that Putin made 
repeating again the point that the Russians have no plans to attack any NATO state. They have no intention of expanding their forces, their advance westwards beyond Ukraine. Uh, Putin explained that the entire rationale of the operation in Ukraine was to protect Russians in Russia's historic territories. It was in no sense an expansionary, expansionist or aggressive um, operation. His words were accompanied by a lengthy discussion of the relative spending that Russia undertakes on defense and what the United States and Russia undertake in terms of defense. Putin pointing out that the Western powers and the United States in particular spend many, spend many multiples more on military matters than Russia does. In the case of the United States, more than 10 times more. And also, Putin made the point that has been made by the Russians many, many times, that it is NATO that has been moving eastwards towards their borders, not the other way around. Anyway, all of that Putin has said before. It is interesting that he's saying it again, but he's gone out of his way to make clear one more time that the Russians do not harbour any aggressive intentions against any NATO state. This is a conflict about Ukraine and a proxy war fought out by Russia against the collective West in Ukraine and the Russians have no interest or desire to expand it beyond that. But then he also had something very interesting to say about the topic of the F-16s. And this is what he said. And he said this in response to this question. So the question, we have this question as far as we can see in its entirety. Question from a military cadet, a trainee. Comrade Supreme Commander-in-Chief, NATO countries are planning to send their fighter jets to Ukraine. The media report that F-16 aircraft will be deployed against Russian forces and facilities in the special military operation, operation zone. Will we be allowed to hit these targets at NATO airfields? And Putin responded to that as follows. First, if they supply F-16s, they're talking about this and looks like they're training pilots. I believe that you realize this like no one else and better than others. This will not change the situation on the battlefield. We will destroy their aircraft, just like we're now destroying their tanks, armored vehicles and other equipment, including multiple launch rocket systems. Of course, we would see them as legitimate targets if they operate from airfields of third countries, no matter where they are located. F-16 aircraft can also carry nuclear weapons, and we will also have to heed this whilst organising our combat operations. That is a straightforward warning that if NATO has any plan to operate F-16s in Ukraine, basing them from airfields in Romania and Poland, as has been discussed, then the Russians, as far as they're concerned, have every right to attack those aircraft at those bases in Romania and Poland. And Putin has also emphasize the point that these are aircraft capable of carrying nuclear weapons. And that's a clear hint that in case of retaliation from NATO to strikes on Western bases in Romania and Poland, the Russians will be placed, are already placed on a higher nuclear alert. Now, of course, 
Over the last few days, we've had a stark demonstration of Russian ability to strike at bases in Romania and Poland. We had a few days ago an incident where a Russian missile, cruise missile, briefly entered Polish territory for apparently all of 40 seconds before turning round and striking a target inside Ukraine. So the Russians demonstrated that they have the will and the ability to penetrate into Polish airspace if they need to. The Russians have also now used Zircon hypersonic missiles against Kiev. Now there are the usual claims by various people in Ukraine that the Ukrainians successfully intercepted these Zircon hypersonic missiles. I don't think anybody takes these claims seriously. The facts speak for themselves. And of course, the NATO powers know that these missiles both possess the range and the ability to penetrate NATO defences and to strike at targets deep within Romania and Poland. Now, I say that it seems these hypersonic missiles were launched from the Black Sea, apparently from submarines. NATO and Ukraine have no ability to track Russian submarines in the Black Sea. I read a bizarre article in the Daily Telegraph claiming a couple of days ago that the entire Russian fleet in the Black Sea has now become inoperative. This is on the basis of various Ukrainian claims to have damaged or destroyed various elderly amphibious landing ships and one missile corvette, as well, it must be said, as one more modern patrol ship. Anyway, that claim is, in fact, absurd and clearly wrong. But we see how wrong it is, because, to reiterate again, it looks like the Zircon missiles that attacked Kiev a couple of days ago were launched from the Black Sea by Russian submarines operating in the Black Sea. And NATO, as I said, has no means at the moment to track or destroy those submarines, at least when they're underwater. So, there we go. A very, very clear warning from Putin indeed. Now, this compounds the general crisis in Western decision-making at the moment. Chancellor Olaf Scholz has now come out again and made another statement ruling out supply of Taurus missiles to Russia and again reiterating that uh, NATO troops will not be sent to fight in Ukraine. Of course, there are lots of NATO troops in Ukraine. We will come back to that in a moment. But they are operating covertly. There is no question of NATO troops going into battle against the Russians in Ukraine as if NATO and Russia were straightforwardly at war. The Germans, the German government, is ruling that out. Apparently, Annalena Baerbock, unsurprisingly, has lobbied Scholz and other officials of the German government to get them to agree to supply Taurus missiles to Ukraine. For once, she has been conclusively overruled. And I understand that on this issue, on this topic, even members of the Green Party are opposing her. So that's the stance that the Germans are taking, and it appears to be widely shared across Europe. Now, we've also had a report, again, from recollection, it was in Bloomberg, that the Biden administration is very angry with Macron for bringing up the whole topic of deploying NATO troops to Ukraine, at least in the way that Macron said 
The Americans did not want this topic discussed. What they have been obliged to do, what all the NATO countries, apart from France and a few others, have been obliged to do, is to reiterate and re-emphasize their red line, which is against deploying troops to Ukraine. And for that reason alone, for the reason of dispelling ambiguity on this issue, which might have confused the Russians, might have confused the Russians, the Americans are angry with Macron because by floating the idea of sending NATO troops to Ukraine, Macron has set in train a series of discussions and statements from senior NATO officials which categorically rule it out. When Macron floated his idea initially, there were all sorts of claims that he did this seeking to create strategic ambiguity, cloud the Russians' mind, make them uncertain about what NATO, France, ultimately the United States might be prepared to do. Well, if you believe the article in Bloomberg, which I, as it happens, I do, then what Macron has done is the exact opposite. He has now made the Russians even more confident than they were before that NATO troops are not going to be deployed to Ukraine. But all of these discussions over the last few weeks, discussions about supplying Taurus missiles to Ukraine, discussions about sending troops to Ukraine, what they have also done is given Putin a very, cl a very clear opportunity to set out Russia's own red lines. If missiles, NATO missiles, attack targets inside Russia, the Russians reserve the right to retaliate in kind against NATO states. If F-16s operate from NATO bases in Poland and Romania, the Russians will consider themselves entitled to attack those F-16s in those bases. Given that the F-16s are nuclear capable, the Russians, the moment the F-16s are deployed, will place themselves at a higher level of nuclear readiness. And if NATO troops are unwise enough to enter Ukraine, Putin again has made it absolutely clear, as have other Russian officials, that in that case they are a target. In every instance, I get the sense of Western confusion, uncertainty as to how to proceed. We see the Germans backtracking hard on the Taurus missile, unwilling now to supply it, frightened about the threats of Russian, direct Russian retaliation against themselves. We have the British now also showing further signs of alarm. There's been an article today in the Daily Telegraph, actually it appeared yesterday, but it admitted that you, the British military couldn't fight Russia for longer than two months. And this has been said by the deputy of the British Defence Staff, Lieutenant General, General Sir Rob Magowan, and he said that the, the British military cannot fight Russia for more than two months. It lacks the resources to do so. He did give all kinds of reassurances that in the event that there was a war with Russia, Britain expects to be fighting alongside NATO. But of course, that depends 
on many things, whether the, what the circumstances of the fight are, whether all of the other NATO states would indeed be willing to come to Britain's rescue in that kind of conflict, and what the Americans would say. So you could see, again, as I said, the nervousness starting to spread and the anger on the part of the Americans as well, that in effect, their bluff about sending troops to Ukraine, or rather not exactly a bluff, but anyway, the nebulous threat that has been existed has been called, not by Putin, but amazingly, but by their own ally, President Macron. Now, all of this takes me back to the situation on the battle lines, because the reason that there is all this confusion is because we have a gathering crisis on the battlefronts. As I said previously, we're now apparently in the period of the most intense Rasputitsa, the mud season. That must be slowing down movement on the battlefronts, at least to some extent. And yet we see that in multiple places, the Russians are still advancing. And this today, the big news again is coming from the Avdevka sector. Um, more reports have been pouring in of Russian advances west of Toninka. This is now old news. We've been getting this for several days, though it does seem that the Russians are making significant advances um, north of Pervomaisky, which, as I said, must fall, if you look at the map, before very long. But we're also getting further news that another village, Semyonovka, is about to fall, that the Russians are attacking it from two directions, and also that Ukrainian defences in the northernmost village in the Avdevka sector, Berdichi, are starting to collapse. And Putin spoke when he addressed the military cadets about the fact that the Russians have been destroying NATO tanks, NATO-supplied tanks, to Ukraine. Today, as it happens, we've seen there's been more pictures supplied by the Russians, which appear to show another Abrams tank, the fifth in a row, which has been destroyed, at least according to the Russians, in the Berdichi area. So it looks as if the battles for Berdichi and Semyonovka are coming to an end bringing to a final end this Ukrainian defence line. Now, there are further reports, very astonishing and peculiar reports, at least to me, that the Ukrainians, despite the fact that their defences around Toninka and Orlovka and Berdichi and Semyonovka are all collapsing, that they're continuing to send reinforcements to the area, that they're sending more and more of their reserves to try to stem the Russian, or at least slow, the Russian advance. And Dima, in his latest video at the Military Summary Channel, expressed his bafflement at this strange decision. Why try to preserve a defence line, which to all intents and purposes has already collapsed? Why throw the lives of more men defending a collapsed defence line, throw away those lives on top of all of the other lives which have already been lost? Why burn up even more precious material, yet another Abrams tank, for example, trying to defend this already collapsed defence line? It makes no sense. Well, I have to say this, I've been making this point throughout the entire period of the special military operation. The Ukrainians repeatedly act in this way. They do so whenever one of their positions comes under threat. Instead of considering 
whether the position is defendable, they defend it far beyond any point of reason. And all that does is it accelerates, it increases to exorbitant levels their own casualties. And of course, touching on personalities now, General Sirsky, the new current military commander of Ukraine's armed forces, has a particular record in doing this sort of thing. He did it to an astonishing degree during the Battle of Bakhmut last year, and he seems to be doing it again in the Avdevka area. All logic suggests that the Ukrainians should retreat behind the river line to the west, try to create fortifications there, pull their troops back, pull their troops out of Pervomaisky, where there is a real risk that they might be encircled. But of course, that's not what Zelensky wants, and it's not what Sirsky does. So, a further collapse in Avdevka. And we are also <laughs> getting news now that the battle of Novomikhailovka, this big village south of Marinka, is almost ended. It seems that the Russians now control around two-thirds of this village. They've managed to clear um, territory both to the north and south of it, including a fort various fortified positions around some barracks buildings that the Ukrainians had immediately to the north of this village. Uh, this battle for Novel Mikhailovka has gone on for a long time. I get the impression that the Russians have only committed a relatively small force to the capture of this particular village. But even here, we see that the Ukrainian position is now untenable. It would make sense for the Ukrainians to withdraw from Novo Mikhailovka. But of course, instead, they hold on. And the rationale is, of course, always the same rationale, that if Novo Mikhailovka is lost, it will open the way for further Russian advances, for more roads and railway lines uh, to the west and southward to Vugleda to be cut. This is no doubt true, but the point is that sooner or later Novo Mikhailovka would fall anyway. And why therefore defend it in this way when the outcome you fear is inevitably going to happen? I, again, I am at a complete loss to understand the logic, but it is the logic that Zelensky and Sirsky have consistently followed. And, well, there's been less information from other battlefronts, but there are reports that the Russians now control most of Bogdanovka near, Bog Bogdanovka, near um, Bakhmut, that they're on the outskirts of Chasov Yar, that there's heavy bombing of Chasov Yar, and there's also reports that the Russians have now begun their assault further north on the village of Terni on the Zherebets River, and that they're preparing a significant offensive in the Siversk area to try to capture the town of Siversk, which appears to be connected in some way with this advance towards Terni on the Zherebets River. The advance, by the way, the Russian advance, in the Bakhmut area and towards Terni will have happened across open fields, precisely the kind of ground where the Rasputitsa is presumably presenting the greatest problems. So the fact that the Russians have been able to conduct these advances and the fact that they've also been able to keep their 
um, forward units in places like Berdici and Orlovka and Toninka and beyond Toninka supplied that they would again have to cross open fields in the Rasputitsa period gives a sense of the determination the Russians are showing in maintaining their advance at this particular time. So anyway, that's a brief summary of the situation on the front lines. Now, going back to the F-16 affair, I'm going to say straight away that this is starting to look increasingly like a debacle. Politico, I believe it was Politico, recently wrote an article about the situation with the F-16s. It seems that the total number that Ukraine can expect to get in June, or perhaps even later, is going to be six. There's apparently around a dozen more coming later in the year, but the bulk of them, 45 in total, will not have arrived before the start of 2025. Denmark apparently is now saying that it's not prepared to supply Ukraine with more F-16s. So if Ukraine starts losing F-16s, it looks as if Denmark and probably the other NATO states will not replace them. So this is starting to look like a one-shot affair. Apparently there's only 12 pilots so far trained to fly these aircraft and saying that they're trained to fly these aircraft is a stretch because the period of training has been extremely reduced and part of it had to be used to teach these pilots English. The air bases in Ukraine continue to be unsuitable for operating the F-16 and we've seen that the Russians now are able to attack any Ukrainian base at any time whenever they feel the need to do so. Putin has just given a very, very strong warning about what might happen if Romanian and Polish airfields are used to operate these F-16s. And I spoke about the nervousness and doubts that are now gripping the West, about the reluctance by the Germans to supply the Taurus missiles, the general reluctance to supply, to deploy uh, NATO troops openly to the fight in Ukraine. I'm getting the sense that the Danes, at least, are now having second thoughts about the wisdom of supplying the F-16s as well. It's clear that this wasn't well thought out. It never is, by the way. But anyway, already this plan is starting to fall apart. Or so, at least, it seems to me. NATO countries are now confronted with a horrible choice. Either they supply the F-16s directly to Ukraine, and they end up on Ukrainian air bases where they will be quickly destroyed by the Russians, or the F-16s are deployed to bases in Romania and Poland, in which case, based on what Putin has just said, there is a massive risk of an enormous escalation with the Russians giving a pointed warning that since the F-16 is itself nuclear capable, they're putting their own nuclear forces on a much higher state of alert. However you unscramble this, the decision making has been awful. Plans are hatched, they're never properly thought out. One wonders whether they've been discussed with the right people. The Pentagon it's clear to me, was always opposed to the supply of the F-16s. They always understood the problems. They were disregarded. The British, the Dutch and the Danes wanted to go ahead. They formed their fighter jet coalition. 
it's unclear whether they ever consulted um, the military people in their respective countries about the wisdom of this idea. And already, before any F-16 has been delivered, it looks like that whole idea is falling apart. Well, that's the F-16 saga. But let's go back again to what's happening on the battlefronts, because we again see the mounting problems. There is much less talk now about supplying ammunition to Ukraine. President Pavel's ideas about supplying Ukraine with 800,000 rounds of ammunition bought on the international arms market. We're not hearing very much about that any longer. The Europeans, one senses, are no longer even really thinking about supplying ammunition from current production. There's no more talk about supplying more tanks to Ukraine. The Germans are not supplying more Leopard 2s. The Leopard 1s, one wonders what became of them, because they've never appeared on the battlefronts. A Marder, German Marder infantry fighting vehicle got stuck in the mud and was captured by the Russians, apparently intact, and has been hauled off, no doubt, so that he can join other Western weapon systems in the museum the Russians have, I believe in Kubinka. <laughs> um, uh, there is no real plan or sign of a plan at the moment. And fears are now increasing of a major Russian offensive on the way. No less a place than The Economist is now talking about this. They're saying that in May, when the Rasputitsa ends fully and the ground hardens, the Russians might go on the attack and that they're building up their forces and Ukraine needs to be ready. Though what Ukraine can do when it's short of everything, tanks, ammunition, infantry fighting vehicles, guns, artillery, even, by the way, drones, nobody makes clear what the Ukrainians can do when the Russians are now systematically seizing total air supremacy over Ukraine's skies, when they've demonstrated that with a hypersonic missiles they can strike anywhere in Ukraine, when they are now bombing pretty much at will on the front lines, and when the West appears to have run out of its ability to supply Ukraine with more air defence missiles. Both Zelensky and his foreign minister, uh, Dmitry Kuleba, are bitterly complaining about Western in inability to supply air defence missiles to Ukraine. Well, again, there doesn't seem to be any real idea about how to rectify that problem. And going back again to the situation of the Ukrainians, what they're supposed to do is there is a big Russian offensive in May. By the way, I don't know that there is. The Russians have never spoken about their plans to launch such an offensive. Well, what the Ukrainians are going to do in the face of it, I, I personally don't know. Now, President Zelensky has just visited Sumy region. He's examined there the various um, fortifications that the Ukrainians are building in that region in order to stem the Russian advance, if it comes. The pictures that I've seen the information that I've received from people who know about such things, all of them say that there is no realistic possibility that the Ukrainians can ever reproduce anything remotely like the Surovikin line that the Russians created in 
in, 20, in the winter of 2022-2023, um, which defeated Ukraine's 2023 summer offensive. And, of course, the Russians have a far more powerful array of weapons at their disposal than the strange medley of weapons the Ukrainians had when they launched their offensive in 2023. The Russians have an increasingly powerful air force. That air force is equipped with increasingly powerful bombs. The Fab 3000s will soon be entering service. Other types of bombs, including jet-powered bombs, are also starting to appear. Um, there's been many reports confirming what a member of the Duran community told me way back in the autumn of 2022, that the most effective way to destroy fortifications is to drop bombs on them. The Ukrainians were not able to do that with the far more powerful defences of the Surovikin line because they didn't have much of an air force. The Russians have a very powerful air force and they have the bombs and they're operating on the front lines at will. And all the evidence suggests that they will have no difficulty breaking, well, that, well I, I, that's an overstatement. They may have considerable difficulty breaking through Ukrainian defences, but they have the capability to do it. They also, by the way, have engineering support to a level that the Ukrainians have never done. So Zelensky can tour fortifications. He can tell himself that he is building major fortified barriers, including minefields. But the realities are that the balance on the battlefields in respective fighting power is now becoming lopsided and lopsided against him. And going back to my previous point about things never having been thought through. It turns out that the latest plan with the Russian frozen assets, the seizing, not the capital, held in Euroclear, $260 billion worth of it, apparently, the frozen assets of the Russian Central Bank, but seizing the interest around $5 billion dollars apparently. Well, even that now, apparently, is going horribly wrong because the Russians are threatening to bring legal action. Uh, the central bank has apparently been consulting with relevant law firms, not Western law firms, I believe, um, about bringing legal action. Um, Euroclear is beginning to get cold feet. Apparently, it has branches in places like Singapore, Hong Kong and Dubai and the courts in these jurisdictions, not as they are not Western courts, might be prepared to side with Russia in a case where, to be frank, all the legal facts stack up in Russia's favour. Anyway, Euroclear now risks successful legal action being taken by the Russians against it in all of these jurisdictions. It risks having its own assets frozen or seized. And of course, the whole point about Euroclear is that in order for it to function properly, it must function as a global depository located in all sorts of places around the world. So suddenly there's been nervousness about this. And the idea of seizing the interest of the Russian assets. At the moment, it's been put on hold. The money is going to be kept with Euroclear in order to cover 
possible legal expenses in case the Russians decide to bring litigation, which, by the way, they will. So, again, even that plan now looks as if it was never thought through properly, which is a point that I've discussed many times. The one thing that no one in the West is still able to do is negotiate, pick up the phone or talk. The extent of communication between the Russians and the West has reached catastrophic minimal levels. And we now have an example of what that means in an article that has appeared in the New York Times. And it is about the Crocus City Hall attack. Now, one of the subplots in this Crocus City Hall attack, an important subplot, is the issue of the warning that the Americans gave to the Russians in advance of this attack. And US officials, European officials, Western commentators, in fact, the Western media with almost total unanimity, I notice even Seymour Hirsch is taking this line in his latest article, are all saying that the United States, the US intelligence community gave a proper warning to the Russians about an attack being prepared by ISIS-K in Moscow, and the Russians disregarded that warning. Well, it started to look as if that was, <laughs> that things were anyway rather more complicated. The Russians have denied that they were given proper warning of what happened. And I've already discussed in previous videos that if the warning the United States gave to the Russians in private is the same as the warning that the United States and British embassies made publicly on 7th March, then the warning was indeed vague. It didn't say who the attackers might be, and, of course, it was time-limited to a period of just 48 hours. And, of course, those 48 hours passed, and no attack occurred, and no further warning, as far as I know, was given. Anyway, New York Times now tells us that the adversarial relationship between Washington and Moscow prevented U.S. officials from sharing any information about the plot beyond what was necessary out of fear Russian authorities might learn their intelligence sources or methods. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, I don't know, but it looks as if the warning that the Americans gave to the Russians in advance of the Crocus City Hall attack was vague and didn't provide much in the way of information. And I'm going to make a guess that it too was time limited, perhaps to 48 hours. I've noticed, by the way, that commentaries in the West never or hardly scarcely ever acknowledge that the 7th March warning was a warning covering a specific period of 48 hours. A period, by the way, when a very big rock concert was happening at Crocus City Hall and information, lots of information from multiple witnesses confirmed that security during that 48-hour period at Crocus City Hall was indeed very strong. So the Russians were given a vague warning. Apparently it talked about a concert. Probably it just talked about Moscow. No particular indication of 
where in Moscow. Maybe the Americans had more information. The New York Times tells us that they did. Maybe the, Rus the, the Americans knew about the venue that would be attacked and uh, the nature of some of the people involved. But we are told that the adversarial relationship between Washington and Moscow prevented US officials from sharing any information about, about the plot beyond what was necessary. Who decides what is necessary? What, what information is withheld, was withheld, we are not told. But it looks to me, I'm starting to get the sense, that whatever warning was passed on to the Russians probably didn't provide that much information. And given that the warning was not apparently renewed after the 48-hour period, well, it's not surprising that the Russians disregarded it and let their guard down. Perhaps they were wrong to do that. Perhaps their own intelligence was at fault. Perhaps they were overly focused on Ukraine and took their eye off other potential threats. I'm not excluding that at all. But I suspect that the American warning, such as it was, was not seen by the Russians as especially helpful. So we see how even on a matter like this, on a terrorist incident, and despite the duty to disclose that the Americans have taken upon themselves when attacks of this nature happen, the collapse of trust between Moscow and Washington has poisoned even the ability to discuss information, to exchange information about these sort of terrorist incidents. Incidentally, the New York Times also correctly says that the Russians have by now become deeply suspicious of any information they are provided by Western intelligence agencies, and that would in itself have been a reason for the Russians after the initial 48-hour period passed. Well, this is my own view, but given that suspicion that the New York Times refers to, I can again understand why the Russians might have said to themselves, once that 48-hour period had passed, that the, Russian, that the Americans were simply trying to make the Russians nervous and that there was nothing real behind this warning at all. Anyway, a lack of contact is incredibly dangerous. And I'm going to go back briefly to this F-16 story. Here we have Putin giving public warnings about what would happen if the F-16s operated from bases in Romania and Poland, talking about the Russians upgrading their nuclear alert status, doing all of this in, these very, in this very public way, a way that inevitably is going to heighten tensions even further. And the reason that this is happening is because communications, discussion between the Russians and the Americans, to all intents and purposes, now no longer exists. It's clear that the Russians have not been informed about what NATO's plans are with the basing of the F-16s, that they've been given no private reassurances, for example, that the F-16s are not going to be based in Poland or Romania. And the Russians probably have come to the view that undoubtedly they have 
come to the view that any warnings they give in private that they're prepared to strike at NATO bases in Romania and Poland, they've probably come to the view that those warnings are not going to be heeded. So we have Putin coming out and making, giving warnings like this, like the one he's just given. Well, anyway, there we are. Total collapse of trust, a total collapse of confidence. I'm going to return briefly to the situation with Crocus, the Crocus City Hall attack. Now, there's been much less commentary on information about this for the moment. Everybody waits with bated breath for the results of the Russian investigation. But I'm going to say that there are three points that need to be internalised in trying to understand what might come next in this affair. Firstly, there's the issue of the American warning, and I've discussed that already in great detail. Secondly, there is the question of the attempt by these four gunmen to escape towards the Ukrainian border, apparently with the intention of crossing it. And there has so far, as I am aware, been no formal statement from Ukraine saying that they had no knowledge in advance of any intention by these four gunmen to cross the border into Ukraine and that no official of the Ukrainian government would have facilitated that crossing by those gunmen of the border had the gunmen arrived at the border and sought to cross to cross it. So there's been no statement of that kind up to this time from Ukraine. Maybe that's a lapse, maybe that's a product of the chaotic state of the Ukrainians' handling of things. But if the Ukrainians were not involved, I think they should hurry up and make a statement like that and, perha and perhaps back it with whatever evidence they can so that we can assess that statement, that denial, and perhaps take it seriously. And the third point is that, of course, the Russians have captured the gunmen. That is, as I said, most unusual in events of this kind. I, by the way, have come to the view that the reason these gunmen were so heavily roughed up when they were captured is because the um, Russian troops that captured them were under strict orders to take these people alive and probably manhandled these men to make sure that they were not carrying explosives, suicide vests or or grenades or anything like that um, when they were finally caught. I'm just saying. So anyway, whatever. That's just my guess, by the way. But whatever. The fact also remains that these men have been caught. The Russian security dragnet, whatever other failings there might have been by on the part of Russian Russia's intelligence agencies, acted very rapidly and effectively in closing down this case, in breaking this case. And that means, and it's something that all Western governments and the Ukrainian government need to be aware of, that means that sooner or later, probably sooner rather than later, the Russians will know the whole story behind this attack. Even, as many are suspecting, even if these gunmen were contracted through cutouts, the very fact that they have had some communication with those cutouts would probably provide the Russians with some information about who those cutouts were, really were, and what side, what sort of, what sort of party they were working for. Anyway, 
There we are. So, we are perhaps on a brink of a big Russian offensive. And where will it take place? Well, I discussed yesterday that Russian bombing and missile attacks over the last week or so has been on a scale that I have never seen at any previous time in this conflict. The Russians are now bombing Kharkov, and they're also launching drone strikes against Kharkov. I understand that it, as of the time I'm making this program, Kharkov is still without electric power. Power stations have been destroyed around Kharkov. The Russians are launching missile strikes against Ukrainian troops in and around Kharkov. All of this looks to me like a softening up exercise prior to a Russian attack intended to capture Kharkov. That's how it looks to me. Now, I don't know the plans of the Russian high command. General Gerasimov and the general staff do not share their plans with me. It could be that this is all some elaborate diversion and that the Russians are planning to attack in some other location. It is also very likely, by the way, that the Russians will attack in two places at once. They spent a huge amount of time punching a big hole through Ukraine's defences in central Donbass, in the Bakhmut, Avdevka, Marinka area. And it seems to me entirely plausible that a major strike is going to happen against Kharkov at some point over the course of the next few weeks, but that at the same time, the Russians will also launch a strike in the central Donbass, perhaps towards Pakrovsk, perhaps further pushing on towards the Dnieper River. By the way, I ought to say, the Russians take Pakrovsk and push also northward from the former Bradley Square, Rabotino. Reports, by the way, speak of the Russians now having gained, regained control of most of Bradley Square and having largely cut off Ukrainian troops in holding out in Rabotino. But reports are very sketchy and I'm not going to insist on that. They, it, those reports tend to come from people like Rogov and Sladko and people like that. And, well, they're not military people. But anyway, um, if the Russians, as I said, capture um, Prakrovsk and maybe Vugladar at some point over the next few weeks, uh, or months rather, and if they also take Orekhov, that puts them very close to both Zaporozhye and Dniepro. Zaporozhye is on the east bank of the um, Dnieper River. Um, I've found a um, map that makes that absolutely clear. So it is a city that the Russians might be able to capture. Dniepro, there are parts of Dniepro located on both the east and west bank. There is a general consensus that these two cities are absolutely of critical importance to Ukraine's uh, war effort and that if the ca Russians capture either one of these cities or potentially both of them, that will be critical for Ukraine. So the Russians capture Pokrovsk and Orekhov and perhaps even Vugledar. They're well within striking range of both cities, which are not, by the way, located that far from each other along the Dnieper. And all of this might happen alongside a Russian advance towards Kramatorsk, who knows? All of this might happen in the central, along the central front, if you like, but it might be accompanied, plausibly, it will be accompanied by another big strike north, from the north towards Kharkov. And I'm going to suggest that that is probably the plan. And I'm also going to suggest 
that the fighting around Kupiansk has again been an exercise in tying Ukrainian reserves down in the Kupiansk area, whilst the big strike towards Kharkiv is prepared. Now, Jacques Bull, Colonel Jacques Bull, of formerly of the Swiss military, one of the most insightful writers and thinkers in um, on military on Russian military affairs, recently discussed in a live stream that we did with him these three Russian concepts of tactics, operational art, and strategy. I ought to say that for, well, more than a year, in fact, I've been receiving a number of emails from another military person. I'm not going to say who he is, but he too has been discussing with me this, these three different concepts the Russians have, tactics, operational arts, and strategy. And the Russians, as Jacques Beau very elegantly explained over the course of that live stream, see operations as a skill, as an art. It's what you might call, what someone like me might call, command or generalship on the larger battle. And it seems to me that the decisions strike towards Pakrovsk and perhaps ultimately to Dniepro and um, Zaporozhye, strike towards Kharkiv, balancing the two, keeping the other side guessing. All of that looks to me like the exercise of what the Russians would call operational art. Just saying. But anyway... One thing I do want to take issue with, I've seen lots of reports by many people who say that if the Russians capture Kharkiv, well, Ukrainian, Ukraine can somehow get by and it won't be a big deal. Now, I don't agree. Kharkiv is Ukraine's second biggest city. It is a major industrial centre. It is a city that has historically been Russian and which has considered itself Russian. If the Russians capture Kharkiv, it is most unlikely they will withdraw from it. And it is most unlikely that the people of Kharkiv will want to rejoin Ukraine. So it is likely to be lost by Ukraine forever. If Kharkiv is lost, then another important town west of Kharkiv, Poltava, will probably be lost as well. Smaller place, after all. And in fact, I suspect that at that point, Ukrainian defense defenses along the entire east bank of the Dnieper will collapse as well. I think the loss of Kharkiv for Ukraine would be a very big deal indeed. Maybe Ukraine could survive particularly if it clung on in some way to Zaporozhye or Dniepro. But I have to say, the loss of Kharkiv would be a body blow. And I think anybody who argues otherwise is deluding themselves. Anyway, we will see whether the Russians do indeed plan to attack Kharkiv. What we are seeing does look to me like perhaps the preparatory steps towards doing that. They're, they appear to be systematically destroying Ukrainian defences around Kharkiv. They are striking these defences with missiles and bombs. It will be an immensely complicated operation given the size of this city. It's about over a million people, but it's also spread out over a large area and contains many of these big apartment buildings, which can act as natural fortresses. Against that, one hears claims that the defences in Kharkiv are not particularly strong. I suspect that the Ukrainians will send many troops to try to hold Kharkiv. That, of course, might draw Ukrainian troops from other places. We'll just have to wait and see. But 
Ukraine's mobilization law remains stuck in the Rada, the Ukrainian parliament. Ukraine, as I said, is running out of weapons. I get the sense that the West has lost any belief that it can supply Ukraine with more weapons. The idea of sending troops to Ukraine has, to all intents and purposes, been ruled out. And Ukraine's mobilization law is in crisis. If Kharkov falls, if the Russians capture it, then everyone in the West, in Russia itself, around the world, will conclude that the Russians have won the war, that the war is lost, and that Ukraine is about to fall. And in those conditions, given the state of the Ukrainian army, I suspect that that will be true of many, perhaps most people in Ukraine also. I'm going to conclude this program by mentioning something that has been said by a Ukrainian MP. This is, I believe, Alexei Gerashchenko, who is a um, MP deeply unpopular in Russia. Apparently, he's been sanctioned by the Russians. They've classified him as a terrorist, so I understand. I'm not going to get into a discussion about his background, about which I know nothing. But rather curiously, he has reported, or is reported to have reported, that there is now an addiction of gambling within the Ukrainian officer class. Apparently, they gamble all the time. They gamble on the uh, cards and on the, um, well, suggestions in the casinos. There is now an epidemic of gambling amongst them. Now, in some societies, in some cultures, I know that when people start to despair, they do turn to gambling in the hope that if they succeed in whatever gambling game they're participating in, it, w it is a sign that their luck is going to turn. If so, if that's what's happening amongst the Ukrainian officer corps, then this gambling epidemic, assuming it exists, is perhaps a further sign of demoralization and even despair, and is a sign, a further sign, that things perhaps before long will start to fall apart. Well, this is my programme for today. More from me soon. All of us are waiting to see what the Russians are going to decide with what the Russians are going to say, rather, about the Crocus City Hall investigation. At some point, probably over the next few weeks, I expect to get a big report from the investigative committee and the FSB to Putin. The world is on tenterhooks and all of the indications are that the Western powers are deeply confused and unsure about what to do. That's me for today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop. You can find all sorts of amazing things there. Magic mugs, hats, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, please remember, if you've liked this video, to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. There's more from me today, more from me soon. Have a very good day.